Yeah, so I was watching Climb at the movie, so that's the thing you produced. Yeah, you know, usually I don't watch things. I don't usually watch any sort of documentaries or YouTube videos of what I, what I often talk about. So I was like, I want to interview, but I hadn't watched it. I was like, I'm going to watch it. I was, I was mind blown, to be fair. It was very good. It was very good. Pretty Glad to hear it. Yeah I'm, yeah, I'm similar to you. I don't normally watch podcasts on YouTube, but I, I like to listen to them a lot as I'm riding a bike or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So what inspired you to get into this whole world of climate science and exposing the agenda narrative and opposing all these things? Yeah, I was sort of just a normie a long time ago as of like 2005 or so. I tended to just believe what the TV told me. But then I got involved in this thing about the ivory-billed woodpecker where there was a peer-reviewed study with 17 people saying that they had rediscovered this, this woodpecker. But I checked into it as a bird watcher, and the um, evidence was complete a complete crock. They had no real evidence to back it up. So that made me think that peer-reviewed studies aren't necessarily true. And right about that time, somebody emailed me and said, hey, you should check into the global warming thing because it's the same deal. If you look into the evidence for yourself, you find out that there's really nothing that backs it up. So that's how I started uh, down that path. And since then, I've spent uh, on a typical day, I've spent hours kind of reading everything I can about the global warming climate change debate. And uh, I was putting stuff up on Blogspot and then Twitter. And then finally, I started a podcast a couple of years ago. So it's been an interesting journey too for me. Yeah, it's good. You know, I noticed that I was trying to find it on YouTube to watch it. It's got 1.2 million views on Twitter. It's got 200,000 when I did find it on YouTube. I couldn't find it. It was. It seemed very suppressed. I was trying to search it up. I, yeah. Random. I think there is a bit up. of shadow, bit of shadow banning going on. I think. I don't think uh, if you search for it within YouTube, they don't want you to find it. Seems like if you search for it on Google or on like DuckDuckGo or something, mm. something else, it's easier to find. But uh, yeah, I'll have to work on that to try to make it easier to find. One good thing is that there's so many copies of it. There's full copies of the movie so many different places that people should be able to find it. And if you do, uh, if you Google for Tom Nelson Substack, you can find all sorts of additional info about it. Yeah, have you been suppressed or like anything more directly in the past? Oh, in the past, I for sure have. Yeah, there's an interesting thing about how the main post I had on Blogspot was all about polar bears and hurricanes. It had all this different data that you could refer to, crop yields and everything. And uh, Google said, uh, they, at one point, they just deleted that top post. There was like 58,000 posts. They just deleted that one post because it said it uh, didn't meet community standards. But all it was was data. There was nothing at all that was, uh, there's no reason why they would take it down. They just didn't like the data. So I just moved that whole post over to Substack where they're not censoring people on Substack. I also have been uh, kicked off of Twitter a few times for saying the wrong thing about uh, about COVID related stuff. I don't know if I can still even say it on here, but mm. yeah, back when before Musk owned it, uh, that was happening quite a bit, that type of uh, censorship on medical issues. You know, they're always trying to take information down, especially with climate change stuff. I thought 97% of the scientists believe in it. So surely it'd be such a strong consensus. You wouldn't have to suppress any information. But yeah, it, I mean, is there's... It, is it weak? Is that a very weak argument that they make? It is. That whole consensus thing is very weak. And I think the movie does a good job of taking that apart. Uh, Ross McKittrick talks about that, how the way they manufacture a consensus is they cancel you if you don't agree with the consensus. They can fire you. They can keep your papers out of the peer-reviewed literature. Uh, the Climate Gate emails showed all sorts of that stuff happening behind the scenes. So then basically, if you throw everybody out who doesn't agree, then everybody who is left agrees. So they say, hey, we must be right because everybody agrees with us. But there's the whole idea that scientists believe that CO2 is the climate control knob and there's a climate crisis right now. There's no way. That's not true. What would you say the weakest argument is made by these climate alarmists and these experts? Well, I mean, constantly, I'm hearing all the time that bad weather happens someplace, therefore CO2 must cause bad weather. That is a, kind of an argument you see all the time everywhere. Look, there was a uh, hot weather in Moscow. I don't know when that was, quite a while ago. That was like all the rage, like, oh, that's the most important thing ever. CO2 must have caused it. And then as soon as uh, it cools down then in Moscow, then nobody cares at all about temperatures in Moscow. They have record cold there. Nobody cares at all. But of course, it's going to be record hot someplace kind of all the time because the earth is a big place and uh, bad weather is going to be happening all the time. But one person who does a great job of pointing out the fact that bad weather has happened all the time, Tony Heller, 
he's constantly looking at old newspaper reports and old data. And um, yeah, every single year in human history has been marred by all sorts of really bad weather. If you read history books, you find people complaining about the weather all the time, how hot it was, blah, blah, blah. So there, there's no signal whatsoever anywhere that the weather is any worse now than it was a thousand years ago. It's uh, just the bad weather, good weather, and it's all fluctuating. Yeah, it wasn't one of the statistics like in the 1930s, it was like 18 heat waves in America, and now it's eight. Yeah, I mean, that even shows in the data. I, I live in Minnesota over here in the United States, and we have all sorts of data that goes back uh, to maybe the late 1800s or so about how warm it was on each day. And back in the 30s and 40s, we hit 100 degrees Fahrenheit 38 times in the 30s and 40s. It was just really hot. And then since then, in the last, uh, I think it's like eight times since 1988 or something, uh, in recent decades, it has hit 100 just way less than it did back then. And I don't think anybody knows for sure why. They're trying to say, I just read today that, oh, it's because of the way they were plowing back then. They were, uh, whatever, contour plowing or something. Uh, they're trying to blame that on humans, too, the heat in the 30s. But anyway, it wasn't. Something natural caused it to be really hot in the 30s. And that may happen again sometime, but it hasn't happened since then. It's uh, The weather fluctuates and people don't really understand why. That's quite a strange thing. That It sounds like more hypocrisy as usual. So they're blaming it on the human activity or they're plowing and all this stuff and that's why it's hotter. But then when it's mentioned in this movie that the reason the cities are hotter is because of people and all this, all these different human related things, they then all of a sudden go, no, 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 it's just the planet. It's just heating in general. It's like, Yeah, I think the movie does a great job of pointing out the uh, urban heat island effect. What a big deal that is. That in the center of Paris, it might be five degrees centigrade warmer than it is on the outskirts of Paris. So that's a pretty big deal. But of course, it has nothing to do with carbon dioxide. And that's just the way it, way it goes. That uh, I think that's a big part of the heat that we think has happened even since 1850 is the urban heat island, as Willie soon says. Uh, that's a big part of that uh, the the heat increase that we're being sold. But the whole idea that the earth is too hot now or there's too much CO2 now, uh, we're currently still in an ice age, as Patrick Moore says, because we have ice at the poles. So yeah, the earth is uh, way, way closer to too cold than too hot. And we're way closer to having not enough CO2 than having too much CO2. Yep. So um, yeah, the whole hysteria, all all of this narrative is uh, anti-scientific. Yeah, what's this thing? It, the, the media, the mainstream media does keep saying that it's getting hotter and hotter every year. 2022 hottest year on record. 2023 hottest year on record. 2024 so far hottest year on record. Is that true? Or are they just making it sound different? Like, is there something there? Is there a way no, they're getting it, around it? it? It's not true. So I've said elsewhere, I've been following this debate closely since about 2006. And as far as I can remember, every single year since then, there's been claims that this is the hottest year ever or whatever. And the next year is the hottest year ever. But if then if you look back at it after 16 years, that it's not much warmer than it was back then. And very often they're telling us that it's the hottest year ever by like 0.01 or 0.02 degrees centigrade. So they can easily uh, go back in. They can cool the past a little bit. They can fudge the data enough to make it look like oh, yeah. it's the hottest, but but it's not. And again, if you look at the heat waves in the U.S., it was so freaking hot in the 1930s compared to now. If, if, uh, the, if the globe is so much hotter now, it should be really, really hot. It should be hotter than it was then, but it's not. Even in Minnesota, if you look at what was the hottest July ever in Minnesota or the hottest August, those hottest months in Minnesota, the whole months were back in the 30s and 40s. And um, my dad's old enough to remember that. He remembers how hot it was back then, and uh, he hasn't hasn't seen that heat since. Um, it might be true that nights are getting a little warmer, and maybe uh, the the lows might be getting a little bit higher, as they say in the movie. But the highs are not getting higher, so there's nothing to panic about. Yeah, is there any way to predict the climate? Like, do you think in a hundred years' time it is going to increase by one or two degrees? And if it is, is it going to even be a problem? That's a great question. I think we're mostly guessing because it's so complicated. Uh, regardless of how complicated you think it is, it's even more complicated than that because there, there's so many moving parts. I've had done over 200 podcasts on my on my channel, and there's all sorts of really smart people talking, weighing in there, and they're disagreeing because it's so complicated. How important is dust on the ice and how important are ocean currents and uh, volcanoes, underwater volcanoes? And uh, there's all sorts of different ways the uh, the fluctuations in the sun can affect the Earth's climate, just straight up by uh, providing heat to the Earth or by changing the cloudiness on Earth. And uh, as John Clauser says, the 2022 Nobel uh, physics uh, winner, 
he says that clouds are so important. We don't under, everybody admits that we don't really understand clouds. And just a tiny fluctuation in the clouds can make a big difference to Earth's climate. So I don't think even in a hundred years, I don't think we're going to understand climate well enough to say, okay, we know what's going to happen in the next 10 years. Uh, you can bet on it. I think it's still going to surprise us even then because it's it's just very complex. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, what do you think the goal of this whole climate agenda is? Yeah, I think it's not about preventing bad weather. I think it's way more about power and money. And I think it's a war on working class people. It's all about trying to control us and trying to get our money. And uh, this whole idea, you know, there's all these ridiculous things they want to do, like reduce the number of cattle in the Netherlands because maybe the cows are farting too much or whatever. And uh, getting rid of uh, real fertilizer in, in favor of organic fertilizer They're, and getting rid of uh, real power stations and trying to run modern economies on on wind turbines and solar panels. There's there's just no end to the ridiculous stuff that they wanna do. And there's a lot of money in uh, in making us do this. And there's a lot of power if they were to force us all into electric cars and then if they could have control over those cars, uh, they could potentially, if they use CBDCs, they could say, mm -hmm. okay, you're only allowed to travel a certain amount of miles <laughs> per month. If you wanna travel any more than that, sorry, wait till next month. Or you can only buy so much meat or whatever. I think there's all sorts of things that the Bill Gateses would like to do to us if they if we let if we let him do that, but we we can't let them do this to us. Yeah, I'm totally on board with the all. It's all about control and power. But one thing that I've never been able to understand is why they push things like wind and solar energy because it doesn't necessarily give them more power over us. It's like it seems like a very far stretch just to do solar and wind to keep some sort of illusion that carbon's bad. It seems like a very far stretch to do that just to. Yeah, that, that's a good point. There's definitely enormous amounts of money changing hands based on this. And, and there's this whole carbon credit thing that's just a huge market. And the whole thing is about what uh, Michelle Sterling calls it, a non-delivery of an invisible substance to no one. Just the whole thing about all that money changing hand, hands, it's all a scam. And none of this is going to provide any weather or climate benefit at all, ever. It's just all pain and no gain. But I, I often say that if we all just went back and lived in caves and we never ate meat or drove cars or anything, it still wouldn't make the weather or climate any better than if we didn't do that. So I don't know if there if there really is a uh, a movement to try to take down the West. Uh, there might be some. It might be just a kind of an anti-Western thing to try to take down our power grids. Uh, I wouldn't put it past the people uh, trying to do that because. If we actually let the crazy people uh, run the power grid in the United States, there's going to be blackouts and enormous number of deaths, et cetera. If we really try to go 100 percent wind and, and solar, then uh, we it would be horrible. It would be dystopia. And the only reason that hasn't happened yet is that uh, we have enough sane people still uh, around that we're not letting them do that. One of the arguments I hear about the the climate deniers are so bad and evil is that they're funded by the fossil fuel industry. Now, I kind of almost I'm almost on board with that idea because I'm whole industries being covered up and you know sugar industry giving paying money to say fast bad all these different things like industries paying people to support their business. So when I hear people going well half of these fossil pro fossil fuels people are getting money or have investments in them, I'm kind of like skeptical. What would you say mm -hmm. to those people? Well, I would say, I mean, you might think that from the outside, but I'm one person. I've been working on this hard every, almost every day, all this time. I've never gotten one cent from anybody, fossil fuel company or not, uh, nothing. So I think there's a, lots of people like me who are just in it uh, because they're fighting for the truth and for a better future for our kids, et cetera. And this whole idea that uh, Exxon is showering us with dollars is absolutely not true. I have seen no sign of that whatsoever. I don't know if they've spent any money on climate skeptics in, uh, I don't know, 15 plus years or something. So th for sure, the other side is uh, way better funded than uh, the the science realism side. There's all sorts of money, of course, uh, funding the Michael Manns of the world. And there's big uh, prizes, the whatever, the Heinz Prize or whatever, uh, going to people for pushing alarmism. So all of the incentives, I would say just about 100% of the incentives are for pushing the narrative and all the disincentives and the pain are for people that are uh, speaking out against it. Uh, you can easily lose your job, as uh, they say in the movie. If you're a young scientist and you speak out against this, you may very well lose your job and get canceled. Yeah, so I, that's, I always thought about that. I was thinking they'll say, well, the experts agree. And I'm like, well, the experts went to school and the schools are just state funded propaganda. And then they go to university and then well, to get the degree, you have to read the data that's proven their point. So like, of course, so even if they didn't kick people out for 
not be not having the agenda and like bullying them out as you say it's like most of the people joining the field are gonna have those beliefs because the entire education system is aligned yep. to support them so that's a great point i think a lot of today's young climatologists it seems to me that they already fully bought into this thing before they even <laughs> took their first class in college about it and it seems like when you try to uh, to discuss stuff with them on Twitter and elsewhere that they haven't looked at natural variability. It's all been about just swallowing this idea that CO2 is the climate control knob, the weather is getting worse. And when you ask questions about this, they don't know the answers. It's like their knowledge is very, very thin, and uh, they have not taken the time to look at uh, the data for themselves. And if you have older folks like uh, Joe Bastardi is an older climatologist, he understands the history of weather, and he knows, he remembers how bad it was in the past. So it's very hard to tell him that the weather has been worse this year because he can immediately say, no, look at the 1950s, the hurricanes were way worse, all this other stuff. So um, Tony Heller says that too. Knowing the history of climate is one of the most important things you can do to uh, disabuse yourself of the notion that the weather's getting worse. If you know about that history, then you realize it's not. Yeah, what you're saying about people now, they'll see these weather events and you know go against all the data and just think, well, I, I saw it, it was really hot this summer, therefore it must be true. I feel like a lot of people will make that mistake. So you'll get the anti-COVID vax. And I agree with these people, but what will happen is someone will collapse and, you know, cardiac arrest. And I, I have a slight suspicion they're probably, like, celebrating when someone <laughs> collapses because, like, oh, I can make a post about it and get 10,000 likes talking about the sudden deaths and all this stuff. You're always looking. Now, in this case, the data probably does actually go in their favor, favor like, you know, the tens of thousands of excess well millions worldwide so the, the data luckily goes in their favor but i feel like you obviously see things more when someone's telling you to look for it and all that you do yeah yeah i don't know if we should go off into that other sudden collapse topic but uh people it seems like people are collapsing way more often they did in the past but i i'm hearing from edward dowd it might be a factor of 30 more now something like that that seems kind of what i'm I, i'm seeing but the plural of uh, anecdotes is data but i see all sorts of people when um there's a warm day in winter they they panic i see that all the time there's a guy named marshall shepherd who is a major warmest on the other side and oh no he's in atlanta and it's warm enough that he could uh, have a barbecue on his deck and he's thinking this is a sign of the apocalypse. But again, if you look at uh, Tony Heller's data and other people's data, back in like 1790, I think maybe Ben Franklin may have been alive then or on then, it was tremendously warm in the winter in Philadelphia that people could swim around outdoors in January, I think. So there's been all sorts of uh, warm weather in the winter, and uh, they call them Chinooks in Canada. It, it just is something that happened. I think in the 1932 Olympics, I forget which year it was that they could barely hold the Winter Olympics because of problems with not enough ice. Um, it just the weather fluctuates and we shouldn't panic at all uh, if something unexpected happens. It, it's like people expect that average weather should happen every day. They know what the average temperature is. And if it's not average, even if it's too warm or too cold, then they think, oh, no, something uh, something is uh, is awry because we should have average weather every day. But, of course, that's crazy. It's like winter should be snowing and cold and summer should always be hot and sunny it's, like, it's not i think there's like actually that. it seems crazy but there actually is a dynamic that people remember that the snow was uh, more than knee deep all the time when they were a kid and now the snow isn't knee deep anymore i think there's actually that's part of it that uh, they they're bigger now so the snow isn't as impressive now i think that <laughs> actually is part of the problem uh that that's how uh, people have just have not thought about it much yeah <laughs> What is the, would you argue, the single, like, most undeniable piece of evidence that disproves the entire climate change narrative? Um, I do think that if you just look at uh, CO2 levels and temperature levels, if you look at those on almost any time scale, you can look at it on decadal time scale, century, or way more than that, just... Uh, there's no evidence anywhere that CO2 is the climate control knob. That's what it's supposed to be. Every time CO2 goes up, then after that, the temperature is supposed to go up. But that absolutely is not what we're seeing at all. Once in a while, for a short time, it lines up. But uh, we, we don't see that. Uh, it seems like it's the other way around with that temperature and CO2 causality. It looks like over a long time period, the temperature goes up, then the CO2 goes up. And there's usually a, a gap in there of maybe a century or two, eight centuries or something. So, yeah, just looking at that, uh, we can tell that CO2 isn't the, the, uh, the climate control knob. And a lot of people say, oh, we got to wait now, wait another 100 years to see if it really is. But we have all this data already. Uh, we have all these ways of looking back in time, and it never has been the, the climate control knob. So there's no reason to think it's going to start becoming it. 
there's no reason to think that natural variability is going to stop. It's going to just keep going. You know, I'm not even a scientist, but to me, sci science 101 would be like, you have hypothesis. So you're like, okay, CO2 increases the, t the global temperature. So you look at the CO2 uh, 100 years ago, and then you try and look at like all these different things. You're like, oh, wait, it has no correlation, pretty much. Pretty much zero correlation. Hypothesis proven false. That's the end uh, of it, uh, right? Well, you, I think yeah. it's pretty simple. Climate isn't simple, but if you have a specific right. hypothesis and you try it out, failed, what else is there that, that, to, to look at? That's a great point. We so we don't know how the climate works, but we know how it doesn't work. We know it's not just simple. You increase CO2 and the temperature goes up. We know that's not, not true. One interesting thing is we're told that climate science is uh, like 200 years old or 150 years old, and we know this. But in the 1970s, it really did cool from the 1940s to the 1970s. We emitted a lot of CO2, but there was cooling then. And uh, happily, in the 1970s, there were papers that came out that said, it's cooling, it's bad, it's causing more oh, yeah. droughts, and things are getting worse. And humans are the reason, not only just humans, but humans burning fossil fuel. That's the reason. Because when you burn the fossil fuel in a coal-fired plant, you're releasing aerosols, and aerosols are causing the planet to cool. So they happily blamed us, blamed coal plants for the cooling in the 70s. And then it started warming right after that. And then they happily said, just kidding. Uh, it's it's us causing the warming. The warming is bad and it's coal plants. But uh, it, don't worry about the aerosols. It's the CO2 from the coal plants that are causing this warming, which is bad. So it's pretty amazing that uh, we're just supposed to you know, erase the past, forget what they said in the past. Uh, they were wrong in the past, but this time they're right. But I wouldn't doubt that th that'll even happen again in your lifetime, that it's going to start cooling and they're going to blame humans again. Oof. And one other interesting thing I wanted to throw in here about blaming people you don't like for bad weather is this whole witches thing during the Little Ice Age that tens of thousands of people were killed as witches because the crop yields were bad, people were starving, they had to blame somebody. So they, they killed a lot of witches back then because uh, Little Ice Age, that was a bad time to be alive. Uh, they had to blame somebody. And then it worked, of course, because it started to warm up again. But this whole thing, uh, this whole human a tendency to blame people for the weather, it's really old, it's really stupid, and it, it's still happening now, even. Is it true, I, I might have misread something, is it true that in a previous time in history it was like colder than it is today, but CO2 in the atmosphere was higher? Yeah, yep. I don't know, have that exact number, but yeah, it's been way higher. I, Tony Heller talks about that. I, I believe there's been times when there were maybe 4,000 ppm CO2 when there was high CO2, but yet uh, there was an ice age. So yeah, it, it's it's been all over the place. Uh, but to buy the CO2 theory, if there's high CO2, it has to be warm, but it, that's not the case. And it makes sense because there's so many other factors. So uh, Tim Ball, the late great Tim Ball has said that you can think of CO2 as being like the tightness of one lug nut on your car. It's a little tiny factor in the performance of your car, but it's not the thing that makes your car go 80 miles an hour or 10 miles an hour. It's just one factor in many, many factors. Yeah, because it couldn't just be one single-handedly. Maybe humans could be like, because you can't just deny everything. Like humans could maybe be 2%, and then the clouds is maybe 10%, the sun 10%, and the yeah. galaxy thing about the stars could be like 10, 20% or something. Yeah, it's so so complicated. Humans for sure have some impact on climate. I'm not even sure if the net effect of humans on climate is even warming, though, because we do all sorts of other stuff. It might be possible that we'll figure out 100 years from now, you know, all that stuff added up. It didn't add up to warming. It's the same deal with a butterfly flapping its wings or a beaver making a dam or anything. All of those things have some effect on the weather and climate. And just the whole question is, what's the magnitude? And the, another huge thing is, is warming bad? And throughout history, warm periods have been called optimums because warmth has always been good for humans and for life on Earth. So that's another thing. I think any warming that humans are causing has for sure been a net benefit so far. We, we like the fact that it's warmer now than it was during the Little Ice Age because, again, those were bad times with short growing seasons and uh, food was harder to come by. And uh, another thing I haven't mentioned is the, just the additional CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, it's not the climate control now, but it is very good plant food. So at... Uh, Plants or crops grow a lot better at 420 ppm CO2 than they grow at 280. And in greenhouses, people pay to artificially put more CO2 in there because it's so good for the plants. So a little longer growing seasons, a little more plant food, that's all good. Positive. Would, let's say, which increase by, they're saying like 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, if it did do that in 50, just within 50 years, would that be bad? Like because of this sudden increase? 
I think it wouldn't. I mean, people are uh, trying to tell us that, that there's a tipping point at 1.5. They're trying to tell yeah. us that. So it's just like, oh, well, another well, point that, one. That, five. That, that was two degrees because it didn't, there's no tipping point. We're all fine. The well, yeah, increasing. actually it went over 1.5, right? They, they officially told yeah. us it went over 1.5 and that was supposed to be the tipping point, but oh, just kidding. Yeah, the, the world is still out there. Nothing happened whatsoever. Yeah. So yeah, this whole idea that there's a tipping point at 1.5 or even at three or anything, I think there is no tipping point. One thing is we're supposed to think that the feedbacks are positive. So a little warming because of positive feedbacks, because we uh, there's less ice at the poles and all that stuff. It's supposed to be a snowball thing. A little warming causes more warming, which causes more warming until I guess we get an uninhabitable fireball at the end. But that's never happened in the whole billions of year history of the earth. It, that's never happened. So the earth's temperature for whatever reason is it tends to be incredibly stable. So the feedbacks can't be positive. They have to be negative. Yeah, so. I mean, I might be ignorant, but like, to see a, a one degree difference, because they might they might make it sound all scary, but if you were to then check the weather, so let's say your average March is 12 degrees, and then you go and check your, your weather in two years' time, and it's 13 degrees every day, I don't think that's going to cause droughts and like crops dying in the end of the world. Isn't. Yeah, there's all sorts of examples of that. That Dave Collum is kind of a funny guy. He's a Cornell professor that's been on my podcast a couple of times. He's saying there's this whole idea that a little like a one degree C warming is supposed to give you more kidney stones. So he's saying, okay, I live by a lake here. And if you go just a short distance from the lake, it's like one degree warmer on average. Do the people there have a lot more kidney stones than the people who live on the lake? Or here I am in Minnesota. If I go down to Iowa, does, do people have more kidney stones or any more health problems down there because it's a little warmer in Iowa? And of course they don't. And this whole, of course, people like to live in warm places. People oftentimes vacation or retire from Minnesota. They go to Florida because it's way warmer. So the whole idea that something really bad is going to happen if Minnesota gets a little warmer, it's just a total crock. All of it is. What's this thing with... Because the way they say it, it makes it sound like it's going to happen 100% certain. And if it doesn't, their entire theory would like of climate change would collapse. They keep saying it's going to be climate refugees. And if there isn't, doesn't that just make everyone go like, oh, they're stupid. They were lying the whole time. There's no climate refugees. So surely there is going to be climate refugees. But then if climate change is all just this myth, then there can't be. So what's going on? Yeah, I think anybody who moves, they're going to try to say, oh, that they move because of CO2, right? They're trying to sell non-climate refugees as climate refugees. Ah, and they're already yeah, trying to sell, uh, like, a, if a food costs more, if there's a crop failure anywhere, they're trying to sell that as a CO2-induced problem. They're just spinning their wheels as hard as they can to try to blame CO2 for everything that's happening. But I do think there's waking up happening everywhere. People are figuring out they're lying to us over and over about everything. I think people are less and less likely to buy these lies now, even than they were three years ago. I'm seeing a lot of that. That's making me really happy that people are tending to scoff at these lies because they're such clearly, it's so clear that they're lying to us. Yeah. I mean, the problem is it's this almost subliminal brainwashing. You'll see some van like, oh yeah, we're electric or we're going green. And it just kind of, they sneak it in. There's this oat milk company and they put how much carbon they emit like per carton or something it's like this subliminal kind of thing just repeat that every day for decades to people and they might buy into it and then propaganda at schools i don't know what it I, I don't think the climate thing's been around that long has it well yeah i mean when uh, al gore's uh, movie came out they showed that in schools everywhere all the time around 2007 or so there's some mm -hmm. people saw it more than once in different classes and stuff and I'm just hearing now that there's enormous amounts of climate propaganda in Tasmania, that they're just pushing this so hard on the kids in Tasmania. Mm. But I'm hoping that parents care enough to uh, to push back. And that actually happened at my local high school here about five years ago. They were going to have somebody come in and just totally sell the climate scam hard. I found out about it. I asked for equal time. And what happened is they said, OK, we're not going to cover it either way. But I think it's, it is it is important for people to push back on propaganda in schools because there's no way that a captive audience of kids should uh, learn this stuff and uh, have a hard time sleeping. And it's a uh, child abuse, I think, to make kids worried about what's going to happen because of CO2 because they should just enjoy being a kid and there's nothing yeah. to worry about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was a victim <laughs> like maybe six, seven years ago. I used to be very scared. I, I don't oh. know if I'm right. I, I think I might have been a Greta Thunberg fan idol i have no idea it's crazy but yeah but you're uh -oh. saying about tas tasmania or something that's quite crazy because so my first guest in the show just from a shogu he, he's kenyan farmer he needs fossil fuels and supposedly in the schools in kenya in these poor villages they're telling them about climate change and how co co2 is bad fossil fuels are like the enemy 
when they need them to develop as a country. So it's yeah, the I'm a, government's keeping them done. I'm a huge fan of Jusper. I, I am so uh, happy that he's doing this work because he's working as a uh, farmer, working with his hoe part of the time, and then doing brilliant work with his smartphone uh, on his sub stack and everything. Yep. He knows how much a fertilizer different countries use, and he knows exactly the benefits of hydrocarbon energy. So I'm really happy that he's getting it uh, on more and more podcasts. I'm glad you had a chance to be on your podcast. I think we're going to hear a lot more from him, and we should. I think it's great. Yeah, fantastic. What do you think of organizations like Just Stop Oil and Extinction Rebellion, Greenpeace, these climate organizations? Yeah, I think it's not working. I, I mean, there's a bunch of that in the movie about how people, those crazy folk get on top of a train and they try to prevent mm -hmm. real people from going to the real jobs and they get to haul down off the train because the people are not having it. Or the Just Stop Oil people are blocking traffic. Yep. Again, people are trying to go to work and they're getting their uh, banners ripped down. I think... The working people know, uh, Martin Durkin talks about that a little bit in the movie too, that working class people know that this is a war on them, that uh, there's nothing good that's going to come from this. And I think they are waking up. Uh, I'm very happy to see the uh, protesters, the farmer protesters with the tractors and stuff, that they're pushing back against this craziness. Um, and yeah, the Canadian truckers uh, push back against a different type of craziness. I think what the, uh, the elites hope to go for a great reset what they got was a great awakening. I, I think they really did. Yeah. And uh, I'm enjoying every day reading and uh, reading about this great awakening. It's happening. Yeah, because pe people talk about these organizations and like they get strange funding. They're, people always call them like, oh, yeah, they're these unemployed middle class people. Is that, is that true? I don't really know anything about these organizations specifically. Well, I don't know, but uh, I actually, I just had a guy on my podcast, Jakob Nordengard from uh, Sweden, and he's talking about how uh, 350.org, they're supposed to be a plucky little uh, little organization that's funded by uh, normal people or something, but they're actually getting big funding from uh, maybe the Rockefellers, and they have mm -hmm. people with six-figure salaries and stuff. So I think a lot of uh, bigger money than we think is flowing to people that are throwing the soup and stuff. There's some there's a climate defiance group in the U.S. that kind of boasts about Hollywood funding. So, yeah, there's some big-time funding flowing into these people. I think some people are actually paid to protest, and I don't know of any climate protester, uh, any uh, person on my side that's getting money to do this. It's uh, it's seems like all, again, almost all the money is on the other side. Yeah, it's with the fun. These climate activists are always talking about, yeah, we're communists and we hate capitalism and it's all evil. It's like they're getting money from what Rockefeller organizations, rich people. Doesn't yeah, matter. yeah. It, it's it's amazing. I think you might have pointed that out on Twitter that they're also fans of big pharma, things like that yeah. too. It's it yeah, none of this makes any sense. But one great point is that uh, this is a cult. It really is a cult, as Richard Lindgren says. But even the believers can't be bothered to behave as if they actually believe. That almost nobody on the other side can uh, can uh, refrain from flying or they're happily uh, eating food that uh, is brought to them via hydrocarbons. They're living the same lifestyle that you and I are living. They they think. It's just such easy virtual, virtue signaling that if they just say this stuff, they think, okay, I'm helping the planet by saying this stuff. I don't really have to go as far as to live the lifestyle that I want everybody to live. So it's a really weird cult. I think most other cults, people can, uh, are, uh, they've bought into it more than the climate cultists have bought into it. Yeah, this whole idea of them not really acting as if they believe it. So if they really believe it, you know, why don't they go talk to Jusper in Kenya and have a little sustainable village where they one in three of them are hungry each night that'd be sustainable yeah. right yeah i totally love jusper constantly inviting the uh the gretos of the world to come and do a sustainable <laughs> internship i think that, that would be so great because i think the gretos of the world how much real work have they ever done has you ever spent one hour hoeing something i i uh martin durkin talks about that too that when he goes to these protests Hardly any working people are at these climate protests. The plumbers aren't there and people who have actual jobs. It's all people who are students and whatever. They're living kind of uh, away from the land. And these people who are fighting farmers, there, there's no farmers that say, uh, geez, I'm sorry that my plowing is causing bad weather. There's people who are just, uh, they're not in touch with reality that think we should cr uh, clamp down on cow farts and plowing because uh, that's what causes bad weather. It's uh, a big disconnect between the climate cult and reality. Yeah, they, they don't seem to have any sense of priorities like no they don't want any farmers they hate the farmers it's like do you want to be hungry just for the planet it's yeah. a, a sustainability for yeah. the planet not even because the whole thing's just a ton of full of lies anyway but it's like less sustainability for the human race they just want to it's like they want us all to just die become extinct as long as the planet's 
long as Mother Earth is doing good. I do think, yeah, I've tweeted about that. I think a lot of the environmentalism is more based on not love of the planet, but hatred of humans. I think so. These people don't really care about Jasper. They don't care if he's got a hoe. You know, he's got to work with a hoe instead of having a tractor. Yeah. They they don't really care about people. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. So, so, yeah. (laughs) All right. Just a final. Where could we find your work, your movies, or any specific place we we should watch it? And where can we support you? Yeah, I would love it if you would go to climatethemovie.net and take a look at the movie out there. And then if you just Google for it, Tom Nelson Substack, then you can find uh, some of my other work and you can find the uh, frequently asked questions. It tells you all about the movie. But I do think that movie does lay it out in 80 minutes. It does a good job of showing just how crazy this whole uh, crusade against CO2 is. So I think that's it for now. Yes. Very good movie. I suggest everybody watches it if they haven't. Thank you very much.